All right, would you please take your copy of God's Word and let's turn to Isaiah chapter 55, if you would please, Isaiah 55. And like normal, we'll read that here in just a, just a few minutes. Uh, first, I want to preface it with some comments. Um, I don't know, probably this is a universal experience. I would imagine that you've been outside at times and maybe you had an important document in your hands and the wind comes up, a big wind that you hadn't expected. It blows it out of your hand. And uh, the older I get, the harder it is to chase it through the wind and try to put your foot on it or capture it somehow or get a hold of it. Sometimes there's an updraft and it takes it way up in the heavens and you might as well wave goodbye because you're not going to get it back. It's gone. And that, that's happened to me a number of times. I've lost other things. And I've, I've chased things uh, up to four or five blocks and then decided I wasn't going to make it and just let it go. And, and uh, that, that's what happens. If you, if you don't hang on to it while you can, if you let it get away from you and you're not ready, you, you may not get it back. You may not have another chance with it. Um, you, ha- you have to move quickly. You have to move frantically in order to retrieve that object. And with that in mind, I want to read some illustrations for you that all have to do with that very subject. And this is the first one by a man named Tim Wilson. He talks about the time that he was in airborne school and learning how to uh, jump out of an airplane. And he says this, Sitting on the hard wooden bleachers of Fort Benning while attending the United States Army Airborne School, we prepared for our first parachute jump ever. Soon we would soar hundreds of feet above the red Georgia clay and hear the jump master bark out the orders. Stand up, hook up, check equipment, stand at the door, go, go, go. Understandably, the instructors had our undivided attention because we were all so nervous about the first time we were going to jump out of an airplane. The airborne sergeant's voice rang out confidently as he explained what to do in case of a parachute malfunction. And he said this, and I quote, If your main parachute should fail to deploy, don't panic. Pull the handle on your auxiliary parachute. Should, however, your auxiliary parachute fail to fill with air, again, don't panic. Pull it in towards your body by the ropes, and then as vigorously as you can, throw it away from you. Uh, Should your auxiliary chute not deploy again, don't panic, vigorously repeat this process. Then he paused, he thought for dramatic effect, looking intently into the eyes of the jumpers, and then with a slight mischievous grin, he slowly stated this, should this also fail to deploy your chute, don't panic, because at this point you have the rest of your life to try to get that chute to open up. (laughs) I think you'd want to hope that it opens the first time, huh? Here's another one. Psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Grosh points to the research that shows we usually don't respond when a fire alarm rings in a building. Instead of leaving the building immediately, we stand around and wait for more clues. But then, even with more information, we still won't make a move, and sometimes that proves deadly for the people involved. For instance... Back in 1985, 56 people were killed when a fire broke out in the stands of a soccer match in England. Close examination of the television footage that was recorded later showed the fans did not react immediately and they continued to watch both the fire and the game, failing to move towards the exits. Research also has shown that when we do move, we follow some old habits. We don't trust emergency exits. We almost always try to exit a room, the same door that we entered the room. After a fire in the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Kentucky left 177 people dead, forensic experts confirmed that many of the victims sought to pay before leaving the building that was on fire, and then they died, and they use a fancy word which means they died while waiting in line. We've experienced that in other ways, but this way was different. This way was we're going to pay our bill before we get out of this burning inferno, and 177 people lost their lives. 
Grush concludes, after 25 years as a psychoanalyst, I can't say that this surprises me. We resist change, committing ourselves to small change, even one that is unmistakably in our best interest is often more frightening than ignoring a dangerous situation. We don't want an exit if we don't know exactly where it's going to take us, even or perhaps especially in an emergency. We want to know what new story we're stepping into before we exit the old one. You know, uh, we have some exits here, don't we? We have one here behind this rock wall. I try to keep it open as best I can. We have the ones back there where the majority of you came through, and what he's saying is this. If all of a sudden a fire breaks out clear across the back of the church and that exit's no longer available, the majority of us are going to try to get out that door. Uh, very few of us will come up here and try to fight our way out here, excuse me, fight our way out here and get out this door. I don't know what's wrong with me. And get out this door. <laughs> Just go ahead and laugh, get it over with. Uh, fight it through, I'm sorry. Anyway, we, we want to fight and get up here and get out. There's a door back there by Steve. We need to get out that door as soon as we can, but people don't do it. That and the last two illustrate the same thing. I have one more. The Peachtree Editorial and Proofreading Service specializes in Bibles. Catching errors before printing is always important. It would be nice to have a tape delay here too, wouldn't it? But more is at stake when dealing with Scripture. Uh, June Gooden, if that's the way you pronounce her name right, who along with her husband Doug founded Peachtree, says... Bible readers are less forgiving of errors because they expect perfection in the Bible text that they buy. For the Holman Christian Standard Bible proofreader spent two years scouring its pages for errors. They took extreme care to ensure that no word was misplaced, misspelled, or left out. The proofreaders at Peachtree see the Bible as God's word, so they are passionate about getting it right in their copies. None of them wants to see what happened like it did in the 1631 King James edition of the Bible where it very clearly read, Thou shalt commit adultery. As Doug Gooden observed, obviously you try to make sure anything that says you will not, you make sure that in that you have the not. Now, what themes holds all these accounts together? And it is this. You need to do what you need to do while you can still do it. And you need to do it before it's too late. Find a way to do something before the door of that opportunity closes on you and you can't do it. Otherwise, the time may come when it is too late and you are in trouble. And by the way, that's also true in our relationship with God. And I believe that's what this passage is about. So let's stop and read it, shall we? Isaiah 55, we're picking it up in verse 6. We'll go to the end of the chapter. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Last time we learned that salvation is without cost. You can't pay for it. You don't have enough money to get it. And why would you go spend your money on that which doesn't afford you salvation? Now let's see how, how Isaiah carries this, this theme on in verse 6. He says this. Seek the Lord while you may be found. While he, I'm sorry, he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, this is God speaking, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and they do not return without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So my word, which will go forth from, forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. If that's familiar, it's because we have a, an older praise song that has its basis in verse 12, verse 13. Instead of the thorn, bushes and cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to Yahweh for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. 
So in Isaiah chapter 55, the first thing he said is, salvation is free of charge. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and get it. And then in the next part of it, he says, you need to do that while the Lord Jesus Christ, while the servant can be found, because the day is coming when he can't be found. So let's break that down a little bit and see what he has to say. Verses 6 through 9. Forsake wickedness and pursue salvation, and Yahweh will pardon your sins. And that's what's taught in these first few verses. Forsake your wickedness, pursue salvation, and Yahweh will be faithful to pardon all of your sins. Now, let's put this message together here and make sure we understand. It says, Seek the Lord and call on Him. Forsake your sins. Return to God, and He will have compassion on you and forgive your sins. Does the Old Testament teach that you can come to faith in Christ through your works? And the answer is no. Does the Old Testament teach that you could do Old Testament sacrifices and shed the blood of animals and pay for your sins? The answer is no. Does the Old Testament teach that you could go to synagogue every week and the temple three times a year, just like the Jews were supposed to do, and that be what God uses to let you into heaven? And the Bible's answer is no. What if you give more money than anybody else has ever given in in all of eternity uh, to charity? Will that get you into heaven? The answer is no. The Bible always teaches that you need to turn from your sins, repent of those sins, turning to God, and God will forgive your sins. In other words, you're saved in the Old Testament the way you're saved in the New Testament, and salvation is always by faith in God. And we know now faith specifically in the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Savior. The urgent call here, do you see how urgent it is? It's for the unbeliever to seek God while you still have time to find Him and call on Him for salvation while He is near to you and while He will hear you. You do have the rest of your life to do that. And I want to make that clear. You have the rest of your life to call on Jesus Christ. You have the rest of your life to forsake your sin and seek the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But why the urgency? It is because God is not always going to be available to you. You might think that He is, but the Bible says that He is not. You do have the rest of your life to to come to faith in Christ. However, you don't know how much of your life you have left. And that's the issue. You don't know if you're going to make it out of this service. You don't know if you're going to make it through the day. You don't know if you'll be alive to come back next week, but you do have the rest of your life to decide what you're going to do with Jesus. When God enters into judgment with someone, that is when he may, he may not be found and when he will not listen to you while you're being judged. I want to go to a couple places. Uh, specifically, they're in different contexts than what we're in today, but they give us the same truth. Would you go to Deuteronomy 31? Deuteronomy 31. And I want to read verse 17. In the context, this is about the Israelites playing a prostitute for gods of other nations. They're they're committing the sin of harlotry with the gods of other nations. In verse 17, God says, there's going to come a point then if you do that. He says this, Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them. And they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us? And God goes on to say, I will surely hide my face from you. Uh, Go to Psalm 32, if you would, next, and verse 6. And it says this, Psalm 32, 6. He says, after he acknowledged his sin to the Lord in verse 5, and he didn't hide his iniquity from God, and he confessed all his transgressions to the Lord, the Lord God forgave the guilt of his sin. And in verse 6, then he calls on us, he says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you at a time that you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters, They will not reach him. And what he is saying this, your sins will overcome you like a great flood and you will drown and you will die 
But if you repent of your sins and acknowledge them before the Lord, and you turn to the Lord while you have a chance, then you're not going to be overwhelmed by the consequences of all of your sin. And that's true then, and it's true today. And it's what we need to understand when we're talking about you need to do this. You need to come to God while there is still a chance. He will also not listen to you after your death. If you wait till then, it's too late. I'm sure that every unbeliever that stands before the throne of Jesus Christ, they find out it's too late for you to change. You can't repent here. I gave you the chance up until your death. Now that chance is over. But, but Lord, I didn't know the truth. Now I see you. I do repent. Too bad. So sad. You're, you're going to be thrown into hell at that point. It's over when you're dead. You don't have any more uh, reason to think that you can repent before that. And by the way, um, I don't know how all that would work, but if you uh, let yourself go and you get into old age and you don't make this decision, and one day uh, you start slipping a little bit and you can't think anymore and you can't talk anymore and nobody can talk to you and nobody can uh, think for you and you don't understand what's going on around you, and you, and you slip into dementia or Alzheimer's or something, and you haven't made that choice, then I'm going to say, I guess your time is up already then, even before you die. You have to do it while there's still time. In verse 7, the wicked and the unrighteous man must forsake his sin and his sinful ways and his thoughts. Now, what might those be? The context is about salvation. It must be things like believing that I could work my way into heaven or that God doesn't punish sin. Not really. There is no hell and nobody would go there because God is a loving God, and he's never going to send anybody to hell because God is love, right? Or uh, something else that you think by doing it and being good, I'll get into heaven. Forsaking your sin and your thoughts about getting there some other way besides faith is what you must do while you still have time in this life. And you must do it God's way, and you must not think that I can do it my own way I need to do it God's way or I'm never going to make it. Lots of people think they can make up their own way to heaven. A lot of people think, I'll do my own thing. I'll interpret the Bible any way I want to if I do it all. And I'm going to live a good, clean life. And there's no way God could turn me down. And I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of people every week that are cast into hell that believe that before they got there. The wicked need to change their way of thinking and their direction of their life. And that's akin to the idea behind New Testament repentance, a repentance that is also taught everywhere in the Old Testament. I want to turn to Ezekiel for a minute. Um, Ezekiel chapter 18, which is where our Wednesday night study group has just finished. And the last verse in that uh, particular chapter where God has been trying to teach people that he does not punish children for the father's sins, Every man, every woman will pay for their own. And God reminds us in verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. Notice he doesn't say, Therefore, go out and sacrifice rams and bulls and live a good life and do religious things. He says, Therefore, repent and live. God will have compassion and he will forgive that person of their sins that word uh, forgive there means pardon them. The same thing that is used to teach us that in the New Testament. God says that we won't understand it, but remember that, uh, that we are not even close in terms of understanding the thoughts of God and His ways to understanding everything about salvation. And I, I want to just give you a couple of verses to go along with that. The first one is in Romans 9, verse 33. It says, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now you notice that he is quoting out of the Old Testament, the book of, uh, the book of Isaiah. And in, it's in Isaiah that Paul uses this text to say that salvation is by believing in Christ. Uh, go just a little bit more. Uh, just to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of his salvation, he says, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, blameless in the day that he judges. In chapter 2, verse 14 in my Bible, just across the page. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. 
and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In other words, those who don't know Jesus Christ don't understand. To the Jews, we think the Bible says it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's just pure foolishness, this whole idea of salvation, of a God dying for you so that you can have eternal life. But it's not foolishness, it's the way of God. Verses 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, verses 10 through 11. We learn here that God will successfully accomplish the salvation that he promised for the believers. So in the beginning of the chapter, God said, Come to me, repent of your sins, salvation is free. Here, Isaiah, speaking by the Spirit of God, says, Seek the Lord while you can. Don't put it off. And then he wants to encourage us and say, Look, you may not understand what God is doing, but don't worry about that. God knows what he's doing. And then he says in verses 10 and 11, you know what? God sends the rain and God sends the snow. And when it gets to the earth, it does what God wanted it to do. The crops spring up. Now, here lately in the last week or so, every farmer I know is concerned about the rain and concerned about the crops springing up because we've had three years of drought uh, to speak of and we haven't done that well and we really need the rain because we know that when rain comes, crops come up and then there's prosperity. This is an illustration simply from nature that everybody would know in an agrarian society to help us understand the truth about salvation and what he's saying. Everybody knows and has seen what rain and snow will do falling from heaven. What does it mean? It, it, is it, it, it always has the effect of making plants grow. That's what it means. And the result is that man gets seed for the sowing and the seed is made into bread and bread is for us to eat so that we might live. It is what is necessary for us to live. Water can even make the driest desert bloom and grow. In verse 11, like that, when God gives his word and utters a promise, when he said he would not, his word would not return to him empty, the word in Hebrew there means without effect, then that's what God means. God said you can be saved by faith. That's what God means. If you trust him for that, you will be saved by faith. It will always accomplish whatever God's desire was when he sent it out from his mouth in the first place. It will always be successful in completing what he wanted done. If God has promised pardon for the sinner, then friends, there will be pardon for the sinner. And out of God's compassion, that person will be saved because God said so. And God doesn't go back on his promises. This is called the infallibility of Scripture. It will not fail to come to pass what God has said. When God speaks, things happen exactly as he said they would because he is God. Um, shouldn't we take to heart everything that comes out of his mouth? When something is spoken by God, shouldn't we pay attention? Shouldn't we listen? Everything that he utters because he can be trusted. You know, it is true in this life that some people who have nothing to say insist on saying it. God has something to say, however, and we should insist on hearing it we can trust every single word he says. And that's what the purpose of those two things are. He says, so in this way, like the snow and the rain come down and they have the effect of growth, my word that goes out from my mouth will never, ever come back to me without accomplishing what I said it would do. It will never be empty. It will, ever, it will never not have an effect. And without accomplishing what it desires, it's not possible for that to happen with God's word. And then finally in verses 12 and 13, we learn that the fulfillment of God's eschatological promises will stand as an eternal memorial to the veracity of his word. All we said was this. We said that the fulfillment of what God is going to do in the end times is going to stand because God's word always stands and it never comes back to him void. And it's an eternal memorial, if you will, to the truthfulness of God's word. Does it matter what you believe? Yes. Does, it, does God care if you believe some things are on the Bible? Not in the Bible? Yes, he cares about that. Should you believe something that isn't true? No, you never should. If God's word is as powerful as he says it is here, then it is important. And it's important to hang on to what he said and, and even know why he said it, if you will, from the study of the text. Because whatever he said is going to happen. Why would you believe anything different? If God said, salvation is without cost, come to me and, and repent of your sins and, I, and through faith I'll give you eternal life. 
God says, why would you take all your money and your efforts and spend it on something else that isn't going to get you eternal life? And you need to do it while you have a chance to do it because the days are coming when you won't be able to do it. And know this, when I say something, God says, it's going to happen. And it will be that way. You can't change it just because you don't like it. You can't change it because you, because you do like it. The, the point is it's God's Word. It's going to happen that way. And then God says, listen, the day is coming because of salvation. You will go out with joy. You will be led forth with peace. And in the millennial kingdom, the mountains and the hills will change, and they will be joyous before the Lord. And when, whatever way the Lord means this, we, we can't see it, we don't know it, but he says, even the trees of the field will clap their hands in rejoicing over what God has done. So it's a millennial scene at this point where there will be significant reduction of the curse of mankind because of man's sin, and God's going to change things. It won't be perfect, but he'll change things. The creation is personified as celebrating that change. In verse 13, he says, Weeds will, re will be replaced with beautiful trees, and all will stand as a witness to the name of the Lord, who, by the way, makes his word good. And that's the point of this. God says, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. And creation is going to rejoice. And instead of thorns coming up, there's going to be a cypress, cypress tree. Instead of nettles... Uh, like, like must thistle and stuff like that, the myrtle will come up. And it's all going to be a memorial to the Lord, an everlasting sign. God keeps His word. Weeds will be replaced with beautiful trees and all will stand as a witness to the name of the Lord who makes good on His word. Here in Jesus' kingdom, you can then kiss the must thistle goodbye forever. Out here that means a lot. Say goodbye to the Canadian thistle and the Russian thistle. And, and that plant that was engineered in hell itself, the yucca plant, it's all gone. Praise God. The kingdom land will be a glorious place to live and to raise kids. I just want to make sure you're going to make it there. I just want to make sure you understand salvation is, not without, co is, is without cost. It's, it's not something you can pay for. And I want to make sure that you understand you have the rest of your life to make that decision but you may not live long. Nobody knows, so do it now. By way of application, number one, trust God, not men. You know, I notice the world's getting pretty good about telling you about God. The word, world is uh, worldly, of course, but it'll tell you what the Bible says. It is amazing to me what people will say. Well, it's like the good book says. And then they say something the good book doesn't say. That they're teaching a theology of Satan, that everybody gets to go to heaven. God wouldn't send anybody to hell. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. Your beliefs are no better than my beliefs as long as you're strong in your beliefs. By the way, don't try to make me believe what you believe. That's intolerance. Don't do that. Even if I don't believe the truth, it doesn't matter because my truth is supreme. It's relative, it's circumstantial, but it's supreme and I'm going to live by it. It's just a bunch of hot air. And the world is telling people what the Bible says and what they're saying is not true. And that's not going to happen. And this text is telling us, don't trust men. Trust God. In what God says, in what He said is the way of salvation. He knows and understands things at a level, according to this text, that we're not even capable of knowing or understanding. Why would you question Him, the one who created you? Secondly, you can trust God. You know that because what he says will happen is going to happen just as he has proven in the past. My boys got caught up in a, a Christian college who did not take the Bible literally. And Gabriel was made fun of by his, his uh, little group of friends at the college he went to for believing that the Bible was going to come and take place literally. And so he's had a hard struggle with that. And I said... Well, let me tell you why I take the Bible literally. We went through a number of places in the Old Testament where it said this is what's going to happen, and then we looked at somewhere else, and that's exactly what happened. Jeremiah said the captivity in Babylon was going to be 70 years. Daniel's reading Jeremiah, and he reads there in Jeremiah that it says the captivity is 70 years. He looks at his calendar. He said, it's up, it's over. He took it literally. 
He prayed to God, and God said, that's right, the time is up, and I'm going to take my people back. And I'm going to take them back to the land. It's been 70 years. That's what I said. That's what we're going to do. If the Bible interprets itself literally, why shouldn't we? If the Bible says there's a kingdom coming, why can't we believe there's a real kingdom coming with a real Jesus that we can see? The Bible says Jesus died on the cross, although that's before us. The Bible says everything happens that God says literally. Why can't I believe there was a Jesus, the God-man who hung on a cross and paid for our sins with his blood? See, I can because God keeps his word. And then finally this. We are told to seek a relationship with God while we are able. Now, of course, I don't know your heart. I, I don't know what your heart is. Maybe I think I do, but I don't. Only you and God know what's in your heart. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the enemy. You either believe and hold on to the truth or you hold on to a lie. You either know Jesus as your Savior and you're going to make it into heaven or you're going to be cast into hell on your judgment day. There is no other choice. There is no middle ground. Even though today people are saying, well, I don't like either one of those options. I'm going to do my own thing. Once you say, I'm going to do my own thing, you're doing the enemy's thing. Do you understand that? Do you understand there's only one way into heaven? It's Jesus Christ. Do you understand there is no other way? And you can't work your way in? Isaiah has said that over and over and over. And yet today, that's what most people believe. I can get in by being good. You know enough to know that's not true. And if you're here this morning and you think you're going to get in by being good or being religious or whatever else, today's the day you need to repent of that. Maybe even before I close my prayer. Because what if you don't have a day? What if you're about to hit the ground at 300 miles an hour because you didn't take advantage of the uh, salvation parachute that Jesus gave you? Today's the day. Now is the time. Let's pray together.